you often hear Kierkegaard described as the the founder of existential philosophy, and that has to do with um, those that he inspired who have come since then, other writers, artists of various kinds. Existentialism is a pretty loose term, and it's not one that was embraced by most of the authors that are usually classified as existentialists, but um, if we can speak of existential philosophy more broadly as a movement of thought, then there is something different that sets in with Kierkegaard, and it uh, kind of sets a new tone for philosophy. The movement of philosophy in that time is really connected with the birth of modern science and the excitement over how much we can learn about the world around us and the possibility of thinking for ourselves. And in some ways, Kierkegaard is very much in the spirit of that. But he kind of tries to change the subject at the same time because one of the discoveries of modern philosophy is that if you start asking questions like, what can I really be sure about? What can I know with certainty? What can I prove? Um, what can I have scientific precision about? The answer is, well, mathematics and uh, similarly abstract pursuits like geometry. And outside of these fairly pure, abstract, logical realms, um, it's hard to be quite so precise. And if you have really strict criteria for what you can know and you demand absolute certainty the way that the early modern philosophers do, uh, you often find yourself uh, realizing that you can't prove anything or you can't know anything with the kind of certainty that you aspire toward and that you might have in math and geometry. And so uh, the kind of quest for certainty and the risk of skeptical doubt are big themes in philosophy for the 17th and 18th centuries. And Kierkegaard comes along in the early part of the 19th century, and he doesn't say, well, we've been doing it all wrong, but he does kind of worry that, that philosophy has lost its way. Kierkegaard shows up and says, well, what is it that we really are concerned about knowing? Uh, what sort of truth matters to us? And so skeptical doubt might be possible in most realms of belief pertaining to our experience of the world around us pertaining to how we exist, but there are some important and yet uncertain matters, matters that are important but somewhat uncertain or even very uncertain, and yet matters that concern us, which we can't help but hold views about. And even if we just kind of tacitly adopt an attitude, uh, you can't live without having some beliefs about what's true, about what matters, and uh, Kierkegaard would say that it's impossible to live without having some overall understanding of the meaning of existence. Part of what Kierkegaard tries to do is to reorient philosophy toward these kinds of concerns, the questions that matter to us so that we can exist with wisdom, which is what's, uh, what philosophy is supposed to be about, that is, wisdom. So something that makes Kierkegaard think that we've kind of lost our way in the modern age. And I say we because I think a lot of the problems that he noticed are ones that are very much with us still. Um, we still have a lot of enthusiasm for rationality and scientific progress, and I don't think that's all bad by any means. Um, Kierkegaard himself had more mixed feelings about it. Um, but as someone who uh, was good in math in school, who considered going into scientific research um, at a time when that was really just beginning to be an intellectual possibility in his world, uh, he realized at a certain point that that sort of truth had its value, and uh, yet there were other domains in which we couldn't have scientific certainty that were, let's say, they were more important to our existence. Um, because they address these questions that orient our life and that really pertain to our way of interpreting the world. And so he tried to reopen the question of what is truth and what sort of truth is relevant for our personal existence, what, what sort of truth should an author who's trying to illuminate something about the human condition be focusing on, and uh, what sort of truth should philosophy be concerned about? And so um, he ended up having a lot to say about 
how we might comport ourselves reasonably with respect to matters that are important and yet uncertain. And that includes, you know, spiritual matters, as we might call them. It also um, it includes any of our beliefs about what we're doing with our life. And so there's a really compelling view of the human condition that comes out of his work. Um, when we have the intellectual capacities that we have as human beings and we're capable of imagining, um, you know, what might I do? There are so many possibilities that appeal to us, even just in our imagination. Here's something on which you can really pride yourself. You've discovered that you can look inside yourself. So there might be certain crises when we feel that the meaning of our life is more at issue or in doubt. And Kierkegaard, rather than saying, well, those are just things you go through at a certain age and then you put them to rest forever, um, he's someone who says, uh, we should take those moments seriously. And we should worry about ourselves if we never have any of those moments, because uh, those are the moments in which we're really feeling the force of uh, the uncertainty of human existence combined with the fact that we're finite. And so all of these um, sort of famously existential moods like anguish, um, despair, melancholy, and so forth, um, they're ones that um, Kierkegaard does gravitate toward in certain ways. To someone who hasn't been captivated by existential philosophy, it can appear to be just um, a school of thought that involves a lot of wallowing in bad moods, you might say. Um, and yet, if there's an attention to something like anxiety in Kierkegaard's work, if he thinks that we should all take a state of uh, anxious uncertainty seriously and try to learn from it, uh, it's not because he thinks that such states of mind are enjoyable in themselves or that they ought to be cultivated to the maximum degree, but um, that they might show us something true. It's not a coincidence that you would focus on emotion if you believe that questions about the meaning of life are the most important ones to ask and think about. Uh, because emotion is the mode of experience in which we are aware of whatever is most meaningful to us. Um, even in the simple case where we're frightened by a noise and we're not sure what it might be, but we think it might indicate danger. Um, now that might pass in a moment, but what's going on when you're gripped by anxious dread because you realize you don't know what you're doing with your life, um, and of course in a sense we never really know for sure what we're doing, which is part of why we should worry about ourselves if we never have those moods. Um, you know, what might be at issue in that moment uh, could be more pervasive. It might, might have to do not just with some momentary threat, but with, you know, your overall direction in life. But in each case, you're discerning something that's important, that's significant, and that matters to you. And so um, if, and this is something he thought was true, if uh, philosophy has often neglected emotion and thought it's irrational, it's not part of the pursuit of truth to take the emotions seriously or to think that they might, that they might be revealing anything to us, then uh, that has to change um, because there are questions we can't think about without becoming passionate and there are things that we can learn through our emotions and it's actually through that kind of passionate thinking and through trying to understand our emotions that we are also thinking about what our lives mean and what matters most to us. And that's never more obvious than with respect to uh, what we love and care about most and what therefore kind of, what therefore gives orientation to our whole existence. Mm -hmm.